Jesus said it this way in John 13, 35. Your love for one another will prove to the world that you're my disciples. And the apostle Paul tells us how it's done in Galatians 5, 13. He says, serve one another humbly in love. And apparently that was happening because Acts 9, 36 describes a first century believer as someone who's always doing kind things for others and helping the poor. Now I read that and think, you know, what would the church look like if we use that as the criteria for describing a true Christ follower? If somebody used the word always to describe you, what would they say? She's always encouraging people, helping out. He's always doing kind things for other people. He's all, you know, guy never even thinks about himself. Or would it be more like he's always working, always working out, always gossiping, always golfing, always gaming, always texting. It's hard to even get his attention. What would your friends, moms, dads, spouses, coworkers say you're always doing? Pretty easy guess these days, you're always checking your Facebook page, see how people respond to the, the selfie you posted. Look at that, you've got almost a dozen likes. Yeah. Or you set your smartphone to notify you every time somebody's liking your Instagram photos. You know, com- or maybe commenting on the photos, that ping is like it, music to your ears. You know, it's, you revel in the affirmation. And don't stare at me like you don't know what I'm talking about. (laughs) Because some of you spend five, 10 minutes making sure that selfie is just right. You got it down. You know your best side, the exact angle to tilt your chin to lose the second one. You know what I'm talking about. And the caption's gotta be memorable so you just keep writing, rewriting it until, you know, the final reads, just such a good day. Reflecting on great things. I'm going somewhere. Are you? And you wait, ping, first comment, you look so beautiful. Or you're looking buff, dude. And the next one, you're so deep. And then, oh my goodness, I so needed this today. Little do they know, you're the one who needed this today. I mean, this has become an obsession in our culture right now. It's more than entertainment. Social media has become the cheesy fabric that is tying us together right now as a culture. Last summer, a survey of 1,000 kids from six to 17 found three out of four want to be online celebrities. No surprise, right? These are the top seven dream jobs for this generation. Some of these you guys of my generation won't even know what these mean. Uh, YouTube star which is a big deal right now. Blogger slash vlogger. <laughs> Some of you have to you know, ask Wikipedia what that is. Uh, musician slash singer, actor, filmmaker, doctor, TV presenter. And unless you are a proactive parent who is willing to be unpopular with your kids right now, I can guarantee you they are, uh, they are living online and paying very close attention to who's getting liked the most. Here's another term your parents need to know. It's the, the acronym GOAT. You ever heard that? Serena Williams winning again. She's hashtag GOAT. LeBron James, who's been called King James now, is hashtag GOAT. It's the word, you know, the, it, it used to be the word we used for a guy who lost the game for his team. Not anymore. You media savvy people, what does the word GOAT mean? Greatest of all time. Google says it probably goes all the way back to Muhammad Ali. Actually, it goes back to a place before time when the superstar angel named Lucifer declared himself greater than his creator and attempted a coup that got him and his minions booted out of heaven. But today we're going to look at some aspiring goats that Jesus hung out with. <laughs> this is, I love this story. Matthew chapter 20, verse 21. This is the mother of James and John. She comes to Jesus with a special request. She she said, grant that these two sons of mine may sit one on your right hand and the other on your left in your kingdom. But Jesus says, you don't know what you ask. And he has to be talking to them. So they have to be standing there. He says, are you able to drink the cup that I'm about to drink? 
And they're think, they aren't thinking dying on crosses. They're picturing themselves drinking from a jewel-studded goblet. And they say, yes, sir, we are. We're able. And when the other 10 disciples hear it, they're furious. Verse 25, so the, to settle things down, Jesus said, you've observed how godless rulers throw their weight around, how quickly a little power goes to their heads. It's not gonna be that way with you. Whoever wants to be great must become your, a servant. Whoever wants to be first among you must be your slave. That is what the Son of Man has done. He came to serve, not be served. <laughs> and I'm sure he's wanting to say, get it? Did you get it? Let me see your heads. Did you get it? But fast forward to the Last Supper, it's just a few days later, only hours before he's about to be crucified. Jesus takes the bread and he breaks it Luke 22, verse 19, he says, this is my body which is given for you guys. You, you do realize I'm about to die, and it's gonna be for you. He holds up a cup of wine and says, this is my blood which is poured out as a sacrifice for you, and in this point, poignant, painful moment, verse 24 <laughs> says, the disciples once again began to argue among themselves about who would be the greatest among them. I mean, Jesus is pouring out his heart before he's about to be crucified, and these knuckleheads are arguing over who's the goat. John says, well, obviously, it's me. Everybody knows I'm the one Jesus loves. Can you imagine how annoying that'd be? You know, constantly having him tell everybody, I'm the favorite of the, you know, 12. Peter says, let's not forget, I was the only one to walk on water. You guys stayed in the boat. Andrew says, yeah, right. I think you took all the three steps where you sank like a rock. Bartholomew pipes up and says, well, everybody goes, no, 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 no. Nobody's even gonna remember your name by it, you know? <laughs> and Jesus is sitting there watching all this, hearing their proud words, staring at their dirty feet, and it's John who tells us what he did next in chapter 13. Verse 40, he got up from the meal, took off his outer clothing, and wrapped a towel around his waist. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash his disciples' feet. Now, the reason he took his robe off is because this was a dirty job. I mean, this was nasty. And when they see what's happening, they're appalled. They're yelling, no, Jesus, no, you can't do this. Lord, no, don't do it. Now, this foot washing thing seems a little weird to us, but it was a big deal back in the first century in that part of the world, especially because only wealthy people rode animals. Everybody else had to walk in sandals on desert, desert paths. If you've ever been in the desert, you know the dirt just sticks to your feet, especially when they're sweaty. By the end of the day, you are literally caked with grime. So you would never plan a dinner event or any kind of, you know, have people over to the house without a servant posted at the door to wash feet or your house would be filthy. I mean, you'd be going the whole time, no, tiptoe, you know, you're wrecking the rock. <laughs> well, none of the disciples had thought of finding somebody for the job and being the goats they all were. You know, they're not about to do it. So as they argue over who's the greatest, Jesus stands up, puts on a servant apron, finds a bowl and a towel, gets down on his hands and knees and starts washing feet. This is the man they now to believe, the almighty son of God. I mean, now it's getting serious. Yikes, guys. You can almost feel the shock and the pain that is going through them. Oh. He'd already told them in Mark 10, 43, that whoever wants to become great must be your servant, and whoever wants to be first must be what? Servant of all. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. It just wasn't connecting. It wasn't getting through. They're not getting it. I mean, he's about to do the ultimate. He's about to die in our pay place and pay the ultimate price to free us from our sin. Jesus couldn't kneel any lower. So with his final object lesson, he's hoping this will make a dent in their hard heads. Maybe if I, you know, just make this painful for them. And then he tells this story in Matthew 25, 31. He says, 
one day at the end of time when he finally arrives, blazing in beauty and all his angels with him, the Son of Man will take his place on his glorious throne. Then all the nations will be arranged before him and he will sort the people out, much as a shepherd sorts out sheep. And here it is. The I want to be the greatest of all time goats. Putting sheep to his right and goats to his left. Verse 34, then the king will say to those on his right, come, you were blessed of my father and inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. And here's why, I was hungry and you fed me. I was thirsty and you gave me a drink. I was homeless and you gave me a room. I was shivering and you gave me clothes. I was sick and you stopped to visit. I was in prison and you came to me and the sheep are gonna say, we don't remember doing any of that for you. Then the king will say, Whenever you did one of these things to someone overlooked or ignored, when you welcomed somebody who didn't feel welcome and you showered them with love and grace, that was me. You did it to me. Now Jesus is redefining greatness here. This is backward of the way we think. Because everything in our culture, you know, concerning greatness is linked to achievement, influence, experiences. Jesus links greatness in the eternal kingdom to how much we're willing to be a servant of all like him. He's the example. Everything God created was for the fame and glory of his name. And it was all made to be used, including us. And there are serious consequences for not using what we've been given. Does this ever happen to you? You you know, power goes out and you go to get a flashlight that you bought for this very moment and you turn it on and nothing, right? It's brand new, it's never been used. Those batteries were fresh a year or so ago. (laughs) But you open it up and rusty flakes fall out. The batteries are corroded because they've been sitting there, not doing what they were made to do. Well, every one of us is made to serve a purpose and we're not serving We're corroding inside just like that flashlight and the light of God's life in us stops shining. It's the fastest way to rust out is to just sit and be served. Literally, to just be a spectator. God has a purpose for every day of your life. He's given you gifts to use for building his kingdom and by his standard, an unused gift is a waste of life. He doesn't plan surplus days for us to waste but I'm too busy, that's, that's our go-to excuse. And Jesus says in Matthew 6, no, seek first God's kingdom and all these things will be added to you. Some of you think, oh, well, I'm tired, Ron, I'm, I just wanna get in and get out. But by putting comfort first, you're violating our, your prime directive. In Matthew 16, 24, Jesus says, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. We only get one shot at this. Reincarnation is a myth. To live by heaven's standards, we have to put Jesus in his kingdom first in everything all the time. Proverbs warns us about being lazy and the ruin and loss that follow in its wake. Paul says in Ephesians 5, 15, he said, be very careful then how you live, not as unwise, but as wise, making the most of every opportunity because the days are evil. I think the biggest problem right now is we're, we're addicted to entertainment. It's, it's not necessarily evil stuff, there, it, it, and, and there is a time to rest, but I'm talking about excess. And the vast majority of us, if not all of us, are guilty on this. I mean, how often do you find yourself getting through work just so you can get home to binge watch a TV show, you know, and especially during the summer, that's when we make up for all those shows that we didn't watch during the year, or you go online, you get on Snapchat, Facebook, Twitter, Reddit, Instagram, or you play video games into the night. Our amusements are swallowing enormous chunks of our time and affection right now. We're the most entertained culture to ever live on the face of the earth. I'm not even gonna wipe you out with how many hours most of us spend online. Some people hate to commit to anything. Fewer and fewer people are getting married right now, having kids, going out with friends, going to church, because they don't want to get locked into anything. I don't want, you know, more and more people are just sort of living in a little cocoon. This is how Acts 2.42 describes the early 
uh, Christian community. They, they were continually devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. These people were all in. The Bible says they were turning the world upside down. Procrastination, another huge roadblock that fills us with regret, robs us of relationship, keeps us from fulfilling our purpose. Ecclesiastes 11.4 says, farmers who wait for perfect weather never plant. If they watch every cloud, they never harvest. In other words, if we don't stop making excuses and start using what we've been given, we're gonna end up standing before Jesus in eternity with empty hands. And that's gonna be, I'm telling you right now, that's gonna be the most horrible thing you can imagine. I mean, it, 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 what's sad is it doesn't even seem that way right now, but it's going to be the most sad thing you can imagine in your eternal life. But the apostle Paul encourages us here in Ephesians 2.10, he says, we're God's masterpiece. We're his one of a kind work of art. He has created us anew in Christ Jesus, and here's why. So we can do, let's read it, so we can do the good things he planned for us long ago. And we've got help, we've got the Holy Spirit living in us. Philippians 2.13 says it is God who works in you, read this with me, both to will and to work for his good pleasure. We were created in the image of a loving God to be like him. And because it's impossible to love without giving, you'll never be happy, you'll never be fulfilled when you're not giving of yourself. We bought into a myth that just, you know, getting, some, whatever this quantity is, a certain amount of stuff is gonna do it. it. It will never do it. There will never be enough. It's giving. In Acts 20, verse 35, Jesus said, it's more fun to give than to receive. And I'm convinced the closer we get to Jesus, the more passionate we're gonna be about that, about serving and loving each other. God made us to be conduits of his living water, not reservoirs. It's how the Dead Sea happened. When you're just taking in and not giving out, something goes terribly wrong. And the opportunities are all around us. I mean, the world is full of hurting people right now. I don't need to tell you, we are in a messed up world. And God wants to use us to relieve some of that suffering, whether it's behind the scenes, doing small practical things for people, or an idea that snowballs into a a, a major project drawn in all kinds of people. We want to stay open to the Holy Spirit's whisper. It's one of the prayers on our list. Lord, use me today. We're in a selfie culture. It's all about me and here and now, which explains why we got so much anxiety. Washington's a mess. People are angry. <laughs> it, it feels like we're living on the edge of madness playing Jenga. You know what that game is? That's that tower of blocks where you have to take one out without collapsing the tower. That's us right now. We're terrified that every new event is gonna start a civil war, send us into World War III. And it's just fueling hyper-anxiety. It's why people are just on edge. Many of us are, are living on the verge of a panic attack, and it's mostly because we're not invested in God's eternal kingdom. We're not invested in doing what God is doing. There's no single economy in the world that's safe right now. But we have access to a system that's unshakable. The government of heaven stands behind every investment of time and money that we make into God's work. I mean, that's true. That's true. God's, God says, guys, guys. Get this right, you're in a time when you're gonna be able to supernaturally see this like never before. We need to be investing in people more than ever. This is a time for you 20, 30-somethings to get on board with us and own this church. Be a part of this place. Don't be a spectator. Our eternal rewards are based on the little things that we do right now, little acts of serving, small acts of giving down here. In a place this size, you know, there are so many opportunities to invest in eternal pleasure, treasure and pleasure, because it's true. In his, in his presence, there's pleasure evermore. This is the time to invest. You've got mega options for serving God and people every time you come to church. 
And sometimes we stumble all over. I, it, it, we had a great example of it. Karen uh, er, Erhard shared this. Let's watch this. We walked through the same door every Saturday night. Sometimes there was someone there to greet us, and sometimes there was not. And John and I talked about it, and we thought, this is something we really need to do. We are already here. We're already walking through that door. We just need to do it. So I called the office, and I spoke with Barb, and we got on board. She, she and, yeah, she and John, I mean, regular now. I mean, they're, they're here every Saturday night. I love it when I catch some of you picking up gum wrappers off the floor, bulletins left behind, simple things, but that's what family members do. You know, this is our living room. It's natural to pitch in, do what needs to be done when we see the need. There are plenty of ways to start serving here. We got a bunch of ministries listed in our Connecting Your Grace booklet, but today I'm gonna ask you to step up and, and help out in areas where it's needed most right now. I know you... You walk in here thinking, well, in a place this size, you know, they, they, they don't have any needs. But let me tell you, that is absolutely wrong. It takes a huge army of people to make a place this size work. Our Grace Kids Coordinator, Jenny Barber, has helped us out with this. On your way in, maybe you notice the displays at the entrance and the atrium uh, that are marked with the names of the areas where we're needing help in Grace Kids, Student Ministries, our hospitality teams, which are greeters, ushers, traffic control, info table workers. We don't pay people here for all that stuff that you take for granted. I mean, this is us, this is family. We're all doing this together. Uh, camera operators every week so you can watch this. We're now live streaming all these services. I mean, all of this is volunteers. All this is us you know, serving together. The cards at all these displays tell you the positions that we need to fill. And this is so simple. We're talking about check-in, pouring juice, hang, handing out snacks, teaching, two and, uh, teaching a two and three-year-old class. One of the most fun things you'll ever, ever, ever be a part of. Leading a, a student small group, smiling, handing out bulletins, helping people find what they're looking for around here. It's a big place. People get lost and so on and so on. These are the things that make this place a family, that help us keep this a welcoming environment for, visit, for, for visitors, and that's what we are committed to do. This is the stuff that will be remembered for eternity. What do you, you wanna guess one of the first questions Jesus asked people in heaven? Because now a lot of people are being resuscitated, we have people coming back to the earth remembering heaven and, and Jesus. And the first question they say he asked, asked people is how well did you love? This life is your one chance to love and serve somebody other than yourself. All right, so here's what we need on that card. Your name, contact info, and when you'd like to serve. Somebody will get back to you. Now again, it can be one time a month. Just try some different areas. Here, some of you are lonely. You're wondering how to connect with people. I just gave you a whole list of options. Some of the folks that are in our ministries, especially our, our usher team, I don't know what, they all bonded at nine o'clock. They go on vacations together. I mean, if you wanna be part of what makes this place tick, this is the way in. Serve your church family. Now, I wanna close with a story and <laughs> This is a little bit lengthy, but I, I, this thing really intrigued me, so you're gonna have to pay attention. This is a whole new paradigm, but this is the twist that we're gonna walk into when we walk into heaven. This is how upside down heaven is from the way we think. Now, the author of this book tells of an elaborate, lucid dream that he had where Jesus takes him on a tour of heaven. Actually, it was a combination of dreams and visions that he had over a period, protracted period of time. Uh, it's from a book called Final Quest. There actually is a trilogy, but you can get the book as one now. Uh, several of us are reading it, or have, I've read it twice, the whole trilogy. Uh, in heaven, this guy sees more than just the throne of God. He sees many, many thrones in heaven, which is you know, scriptural. Uh, so I'm, I'm gonna just read you from the book, all right? The Lord then stopped and I, 
turned to look at those on the thrones next to us. We were still in a place where the highest kings were sitting. Then I recognized the man who was close by. Sir, I know you from somewhere, but I, I simply cannot remember where. You once saw me in a vision, he replied. I immediately remembered and was shocked. So you were a real person, yeah, he replied. I remember the day when as a young Christian I had become frustrated with some issues in my life. I went into the middle of a battlefield park near my apartment and determined that I would wait until the Lord spoke to me. As I sat reading my Bible, I was caught up into a vision, one of the first ones that I ever had. Now this guy has had several, and uh, Jack Deere is somewhere here, He's, he knows him. I mean, the guy has a valid ministry for m decades now. In this vision, he said, I saw a man who was zealously serving the Lord. He was continuously witnessing to people, teaching the Bible, visiting the sick to pray for him. He was very zealous for the Lord, and he had a, a, a genuine love for people. Then I saw another man named Angelo, who was obviously a homeless person. When a small kitten wandered onto his path, he started to kick it, but he restrained himself. Oh, he still shoved it out of the way rather harshly with his foot. Then the Lord asked me, which of these men pleased him the most? Well, the first, I said without hesitating. No, the second, he responded. And he began to tell me their stories. He shared that the first man had been raised in a wonderful family which had always known the Lord. They grew up in a thriving church and then attended, or he grew up in a thriving church, and, and attended one of the best Bible colleges in the country. This guy had been given 100 portions of his love, but he was only using 75. The second man had been born deaf. He was abused and kept in a dark, cold attic until he was found by authorities and when he was eight years old. He had been shifted from one institution to the other where the abuse continued. Finally, he was turned out onto the streets. The Lord had only given him three portions of his love to help him overcome all of this, but he had mustered every bit of it to fight the rage in his heart and to keep from hurting the kitten. I now looked at that man. He was a king sitting on a throne far more glorious than Solomon could have even imagined. Host of angels were arrayed about him, waiting to do his bidding. I turned to the Lord in awe. I, I, I still cannot believe he was real, much less one of the great kings Lord, please tell me the rest of his story, I beg. Of course, that's why we are here. Angelo was so faithful with the little that I had given to him that I gave him three more portions of my love. He used all of that to quit stealing. He almost starved, but he refused to take anything that was not his. He bought his food with what he could make collecting bottles, and occasionally he found someone who would let him do yard work. Angelo could not hear but he had learned to read, so I sent him a gospel tract. As he read it, the Spirit opened his heart and he gave his life to me. I again doubled the portions of my love to him, and he faithfully used all of them. He wanted to share me with others, but he couldn't speak. Even though he lived in such poverty, he started spending over half of everything he made on gospel tracts to give out on the street corner. How many did he lead to you, I asked, thinking it must have been multitudes for him to be sitting with the kings. One, the Lord answered. In order to encourage him, I let him lead a dying alcoholic to me. It encouraged him so much that he would have stood on that corner for many more years just to bring another soul to repentance. But all of heaven was entreating me to bring him here quickly, and I too wanted him to receive his reward. But what did Angelo do to become a king here, I asked. He was faithful with all that he was given. He overcame all until he became like me and he died a martyr. But what did he overcome? How was he martyred? He overcame the world with my love. Very few have overcome so much with so little. Many of my people dwell in homes with conveniences that kings would have envied just a century ago, yet they do not appreciate them. Angelo, on the other hand, would so appreciate even a cardboard box on a cold night that he would turn it into a glorious temple of my presence. Angelo began to love everyone and everything. He would rejoice more over an apple than some of my people do over a great feast. 
He was faithful with all that I gave him, even though it was not very much compared to what I gave others, including you. I showed him to you in a vision because you passed by him many times. Once you even pointed him out to one of your friends and spoke of him. I did? What did I say? He said, there's another one of those Elijahs who must have escaped from the bus station. You said he was a religious nut who was sent by the enemy to turn people off to the gospel. This was the worst blow that I had yet suffered in this whole experience. I was more than shocked, I was appalled. I tried to remember the specific incident but couldn't simply because there were so many others like it. I had never much, I had never had much compassion for filthy street preachers considering them tools of Satan. I'm sorry, Lord. I'm really sorry. You're forgiven. He quickly responded, and you are right. There are many who try to preach the gospel in the streets for wrong and even perverted reasons. Even so, there are many who are sincere. Even if they're untrained and unlearned, you must not judge by appearances. There, there are as many true servants who look like he did as there are among the polished professionals in the great cathedrals and organizations that men have built in my name. He then motioned for me to look up at Angelo. When I turned, he had descended the steps to his throne and was now right in front of me. Opening his arms, he gave me a huge great hug and kiss my forehead like a father. Love poured over me and through me until I felt I would, it would overload my nervous system. When he finally released me, I was staggering as if I was drunk, but it was a wonderful feeling. It was love like I'd never felt before. Now Jesus looks at him and says, he could have imparted that to you on earth. He had much to give to my people, but they would not come near him. Even my prophets avoided him. He grew in faith by buying a Bible and a couple of books that he read over and over. He tried to go to churches, but he could not find one that would receive it. If they would have taken him in, they would have taken me in. He was my knock upon their door. I was learning a, a whole new definition of grief. How did he die, I asked, remembering that he'd been martyred. Based on what I'd seen so far, I was half expecting that I somehow was even responsible for that. He froze to death trying to keep alive an old wino who had passed out in the cold. As I looked at Angelo, I could not believe how hard my heart had been. Even so, I didn't understand how dying in this way had made him a martyr, which I thought was a title reserved for those who had died because they wouldn't compromise their testimony, the Lordship of Christ. Lord, I, I know that he truly is an overcomer and, and as it's warranted for him to be here, but are those who die in such a way actually considered martyrs? Jesus said Angelo was a martyr every day he lived. He would only do enough for himself to stay alive and he gladly sacrificed his life to save a needy friend. As Paul wrote to the Corinthians, even if you give your body to be burned but do not have love, it counts as nothing. But when you give yourself with love, it counts for much. Angelo died every day because he did not live for himself but for others. Even though he always considered himself the least of the saints, he was truly one of the greatest. As you've already learned, many of those who consider themselves the greatest and are considered by others to be the greatest end up being the least here. Angelo did not die for a doctrine or even for his testimony, but he did die for me. Lord, please help me to remember this. When I return, please don't let me forget what I'm seeing here, I bet. That's why I'm with you here and I'll be with you when you return. Wisdom is to see with my eyes and not to judge by appearances. I showed you Angelo in the vision so that you would recognize him when you passed him on the street. If you had shared with him the knowledge of his past that I had shown you in that vision, he would have given his life to me then. You could, have, you could have then discipled this great king and he would have had great impact on my church. If my people would look at others the way I do, Angelo and many others like him 
would have been recognized. They would have been paraded into the greatest pulpits. My people would have come from the ends of the earth to sit at their feet because by doing this, they would have sat at my feet. He would have taught you to love and how to invest the gifts that I've given you so that you could bear much more fruit. I was so ashamed, I didn't want to even look at the Lord. But finally, I turned back to him as I felt the pain driving me toward self-centeredness again. When I looked at him, I, it, I was virtually blinded by his glory. It took a while, but gradually my eyes adjusted so I could see him. Jesus says, remember that you're forgiven. I'm not showing you these things to condemn you, but to teach you. Always remember, compassion will remove the veils from your soul faster than anything else. That's a powerful statement. As we began to walk again, Angelo entreated me, please remember my friends, the homeless. Many will love our Savior if someone will go to them. His words had such power in them that I was too moved to answer. I just nodded. I knew those words were the decree of a great king and a great friend of the King of Kings. Lord, will you help me help the homeless? I asked, I'll help any who help them. He responded. When you love those whom I love, you'll always know my help. You will be given the helper by the measure of your love. You've asked many times for more of my anointing. This is how you'll receive it. Love those whom I love. As you love them, you love me. As you give to them, you have given to me, and I will give more to you in return. I tell you guys, this book has messed with my life. I pull up to a stop sign and I see people with signs and I don't say what I used to. We are part of an upside down kingdom where the first shall be last and the last shall be first. And the greatest among us is gonna be the servant of all. You know, I'm, you, you know what I'm praying? God, shock me now. Shock me now. Wake me up now, not when I stand before you. I want us to get this right. We have had a whole bunch of folks here who have lived this out right to the end. Melvin Tobias was an usher up here in the, in the top. He knew everybody up there. I mean, you, you all knew him. For years, served right up to the end of his life. John Luttrell, faithful, nine o'clock a.m. usher, out there every Sunday morning, big old smile, wide open arms, hugged everybody that walked into place. He looked like Santa Claus. Actually, he played Santa Claus. <laughs> right up to the very end of his life, he served. Rick Clark, his wife Shaky, belonged to second time around uh, group. And uh, he worked at the Central Information Table. He came to church that Sunday, served, was part of the group, went home, worked in the yard, and was suddenly in heaven. Mike Waddell served faithfully on our parking lot. It was one of the, uh, I think, captains out there. 11 o'clock usher that you saw here regularly served on the weekend that he went home. Robert Wilson served faithfully in our prison ministry. He and his wife Shirley served as greeters. Bill Smith, an usher for years and years. The guy was constantly doing things for people on this side. I mean, you can't even imagine the stuff he did. I, in fact, I'd say, I'd talk to him about it occasionally because I was always finding out about, you know, some crazy way of what he had done. And his statement to me, I'm just cramming for my finals. I can guarantee you, none of those guys regret a single moment. They look back on their servant here as the most important part of their lives on this earth. So I'm just inviting you. Get on board. Join the team. We got huge opportunities here to serve in these areas. To those whom the Lord loves, the little babies and toddlers, Jesus said it'd be better to tie a rope around your neck and a millstone on the other end, throw yourself into the lake than to cause one of these little ones to stumble. We got incredible opportunities to serve these little guys and gals and teach them about the love of God. This is his next generation and, and you know, the teens and preteens. We got an opportunity to make a difference. Let's say yes to Jesus. 
Let's serve one another. Let's make the mo this the most welcoming environment a seeker ever stepped into. I mean, we're, we're doing that to some degree, but we need a whole lot of new blood, a whole lot of you young people. This is how you push against the selfie culture that you're immersed in. Serve somebody else. And those of you, yeah. You know, we're not, we're not down on you. We're just saying, come on, guys. Get on board with us. Help us out. You're the leadership of this next generation. And those of you who are headed for your final exam, don't go plant your toes in the beach in Florida somewhere. You know, final lap of the race, Lord, I'm just gonna sit here on the beach. I mean, do that for a couple weeks and come back and serve. You know, finish the race. Finish the race, guys. I, I'm, okay, I'm not gonna beat, beat you up here, but I just, I'm, I'm telling you, this is serious business. We wanna be about these things that are forever. I believe we're on the precipice of a great move of the Holy Spirit, and the Lord is saying, you gotta get your act together here. It's time to get in the game. It's time to be prepared for what I'm about to do. And, and some of you are just, you know, woefully sitting it out. No, no more, all right? Make that decision before you leave here today. Say, you know what, I am gonna sign up. Even if it's just once a month, I'm gonna sign up and say I'm gonna show up here. And try out several areas. Serve in this area one month, serve in that area one month, and see where you fit. All right, stand with me. Will you do that? Yeah. All right. Let me pray for us. Lord, you know how mesmerizing this world that we're a part of is. You know how we've been sucked into it. You, you knew this day was coming, but you promised when the enemy comes in like a flood that you would raise up a standard, that you would give us supernatural power to stand up in the midst of that culture, in the midst of that evil day, and say, I'm not gonna be a part of this. I'm not, gonna, I'm not gonna go by these values. I'm not gonna live this way. I'm gonna live by another kingdom, the values of your kingdom, God. Help us today. Lord, we are reaching out to you. We are crying out to you. Get us in the game. Get us engaged in loving people and serving people and helping people. Jesus, I'm... I'm asking you to speak to people about what the next step for them is. Help them to see what step to take. 